There's a rather neat result due, I believe, to an obscure Swiss mathematician called Leonard Euler, that if we take any convex polygon, such as tetrahedron, and we take the number of vertices and subtract the number of edges and add the number of faces, then we always get the number 2. So let's try it for the tetrahedron. We've got four vertices and we've got um, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 faces, uh, edges rather, sorry, and we've got four faces, so that is indeed equal to 2. Let's try it for some other polyhedra. Let's try it for, uh, for the cube. Okay, so we've got eight vertices, we've got 12 edges, and we've got six faces. So V minus E plus F is indeed equal to two, which is nice. And uh, there, you can prove this reasonably elementarily that this is true for any convex poly polyhedron, and I invite you to have a go at doing that. But being mathematicians, we might ask, can we generalize this any further? And one possible generalization uh, comes from imagining blowing up these polyhedra, you know, inflating them until they just become spheres. And now the original edges are lines drawn on the sphere. So this now becomes a statement about graphs drawn on the sphere. So we might ask ourselves, what happens if we do the same procedure for graphs drawn on some other surfaces, like, say, the torus? <coughs> well, let's try it. Okay, so it's not so easy to draw a graph on the, tor on the drawing of a torus like that. But, fortunately, we have this lovely MathJam postcard with a map of the torus on it. And to make a torus, you start with a square, you identify these two edges, so you roll it up and stick, the, uh, stick it back together to form a cylinder, and then you stick the ends together to make a torus. And we note immediately that we already have a graph drawn on the torus, which is this one here. So our vertices are here, 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 and here. Our edges are here and here. How many vertices are there? Well, that's equal to that, because they're both the back end of that edge. And that is equal to that because they're both at the back end of that edge. So, in fact, we know that there is only one vertex. So, for the torus, we have one vertex, we have two edges, and we have one face. And so that's equal to zero. And similarly, it turns out, if we do this with any graph on a torus, then we always get the number zero. And in fact, we can do this for any surface at all, and it turns out that this number is always a constant. So let's try it, for instance, on the Klein bottle. And if you don't know what a Klein bottle is, it's one of these. It's a surface with only one side and no edges, and also makes a very fetching hat. Okay, so looking at the Klein surface, to make one, we take a square, we stick the two, stick two opposite edges together to make a cylinder, and then we glue the remaining ends together backwards. So that vertex is the same as that vertex, because they're the, both the back end of that edge there. That vertex is also the same as that vertex, so they're the same because they're the back end of that edge. That vertex is the same as that vertex, because they're the front end of that edge. So in fact, again, we only have one edge, uh, one vertex. So for the Klein bottle, we have one vertex and again two edges and one face. So again, V minus E plus F is zero. And by the way, we normally call this number the Euler characteristic or the Klein bottle. Uh, let's look at the projected plane. So this is, uh, that vertex is equal to that vertex, and that vertex is equal to that vertex, but that is not equal to that. So, that is equal to two vertices and two edges 
and one face. So the order characteristic of the projected plane is one. Now it should be reasonably obvious that this is uh, an invariant up to homeomorphism. So homeomorphism is um, a continuous map with a continuous inverse. And if we draw a graph on a surface, then we can transport it across the homeomorphism right, by continuously deforming it. This is not going to change the value of V, E, or F. So two surfaces which are homeomorphic to each other will have the same Euler characteristic. So we have an invariant of surfaces up to homeomorphism. But it isn't as good an invariant as we'd like because the Klein bottle and the torus have the same Euler characteristic and they're not equivalent. They're not homeomorphic to each other because the Klein surface is non-orientable. It's not possible to define an, a well-defined notion of what's the outside and what's the inside because it only has one side. Whereas with the torus, we can. We can say this is the outside, this is the inside and be consistent about it. But it turns out that this is in fact enough. So given a closed bounded connected surface, we can ask ourselves, is it orientable? If it is, then it turns out its Euler characteristic will always have the form 2 minus 2g for some integer g. And in that case, it will be homeomorphic to a torus with g handles. So I'm drawing the case g equals 4 here. If it's non-orientable, then it turns out that the Euler characteristic will always have the form 2 minus k for some integer k. So we immediately see that any, um, any surface with an odd Euler characteristic is non-orientable. So in particular, the projective plane is non-orientable. In this case, it turns out it is homeomorphic to a sphere with K holes cut out and Mobius strips glued in. If you don't know what a Mobius strip, it's one of these, as you can see. It is a surface with one edge and only one side. And its one edge is homeomorphic to the sphere, to the circle rather. So we can glue it in, and it looks something vaguely like that. And this thing I've drawn here is a surface is a surface sphere with one cross cap. It has an Euler characteristic of two minus one, which is one. So this is actually homeomorphic to the projective plane. And the surprising thing is that that's it. Those are all the surfaces there are, all the connected closed bounded surfaces there are. There are these two infinite families which uh, share the sphere in common and that's it.